Good evening. What a joy to be here. Uh, and I say that from the depths of my heart. It is always a blessing to be with God's people, and especially with uh, the people of God who want to better know God and His Word. And I know that that's the kind of audience that we have here every time uh, that anyone speaks. And I'm thankful to be a part of this lecture program. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunities uh, that you have allowed me, not just today, but in the past as well. If we were to ask the world today, who is a wise man? The answer that would come back would probably be varied. Some people will say, well, uh, obviously it's the top 100 richest people in the world. They're the wise ones. They've saved all that money up. They, they know how to make money where there isn't any money to be made. And so they're the wise people. Others would say, no, no, no. It, it, it'll be somebody that uh, understands how to break the back of inflation without breaking the back of the nation. That'll be their solution. And somebody else will say, no, no. Uh, a wise man is somebody that just puts everybody to work that wants to work in our nation. That's a wise man. And on we really could go, talking about what the world thinks of as wisdom. But the reality is that the Word of God does not go down that road in any sense of the word. You've already seen that in other lectures that are presented uh, during this, these sessions. We want to look tonight particularly at a verse found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 30, when it says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and the one or he that winneth souls is wise. There are a number of things that we need to say about this, I think, and that our God's people need to think about because we truly want to be the wise on the face of the earth. We are, after all, the body of Jesus Christ. And our goal needs to be to expand that kingdom that is the body of Jesus Christ. So the first thing that we would observe this evening is the wise win souls. We've already heard that. The wise man told us that. I want us to observe uh, what the International English Bible says here. It says, as a tree produces fruit, a good person gives life to others. A wise person wins souls. That puts a little different light on it uh, from my way of thinking. It puts, in certain senses, the onus on me. I, I can read it uh, at other times and other, other ways, and I don't see this. But this one basically says, hey, it's up to you to play a role here. This is your job, as well as any other Christian's job. After all, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's my job. That's your job. There's not a soul here who's a member of the body of Christ who can honestly say they do not have that role to play. And the beauty of it is it has a tremendous impact in so many different ways. Take what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, when he said, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wise, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Brethren, I want to propose to you tonight that we need more arguments at home. Yeah, I knew you'd laugh. <laughs> we all think, yeah, no, you haven't been in my house lately. <laughs> we, we got plenty of arguments. No, no. We need more arguments without words. How many women are there? God-fearing women. How many men are there? God-fearing men. Who are married to an unbelieving companion who will not listen to the truth. They won't even go hear a gospel sermon. And if they do go hear one, it's as if their minds are just shut down. But because of the example that that woman or that man sets day after day after day, 
they eventually hear a sermon preached about Jesus Christ that is ungetoverable, as Brother Hardman used to say, and they have to do something about it. Years ago, my dad uh, was preaching in the state of Illinois. There was there a young woman who was married, a good Christian woman, married to a man who was not a Christian. He had no problem with her going to worship as long as she made sure that lunch was on the table at noon. That woman got up early. She would fix some kind of a meal, and she'd put it on a timer in the oven. And then she would get herself ready, and she'd go to worship. That worked really well until they had a child. And then she had to get up even earlier. She still had to get something ready to eat. She had to get herself ready, and she had to get the little baby ready, and off they go. One day, it was very, very cold, and it was pouring down rain. The husband decided he finally had his opportunity. He went out in the garage, and he disconnected the distributor cap. That doesn't mean anything to anybody under the age of 50. <laughs> but suffice it to say, the car is not going to start. <laughs> Let's put it that way. That young woman got ready. She got the baby ready. The meal was already in the oven, cooking. She went out and got in the car and turned the key in the ignition, and you guessed it, nothing. Tried another time, nothing. She went back inside. She got her husband's raincoat. She draped it over the baby's bassinet. She got her own raincoat on, tucked her Bible under her arm, and headed for the door. And with tears streaming down his cheek, he said to her, It's my fault. I did it. If you'll wait... I'll get ready, and I'll take you. And the last I knew, that man was a deacon in the Lord's church. The one that wins souls is wise. And you can do it by the way you live. In the ESV, the English Standard Version, you have a slightly different translation. I want you to hear it because I think it tips us off to something that Jesus did early in his ministry. Listen to what he says. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Now, I'm fully aware that, that Proverbs was not written in Greek. I've got that figured out. Uh, I mean, I know a whole lot about either language, but I know that much. But here's what I also know, that there came an occasion early in Jesus' ministry when a word very, very similar to that word comes up. Look to the book of Luke, if you would, uh, with me, and we particularly want to look at chapter 5. You remember, this is what is uh, sometimes called the Sermon on the Seashore or something along that order. He got Peter to launch out a little bit so he could preach to the crowd, by the way, Tremendous sound effects that way. You, you, the, your voice will be heard over and above everything in that situation. The Lord knew that. And then when he had finished speaking, we find in verse 4, And when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word... I will let down the net. Now, just as a sidelight, have you ever noticed that Peter was a professional fisherman, and as far as the biblical record is concerned, he never caught a single fish without a miracle? <laughs> That's why I don't fish. <laughs> but now look what happens next. Verses 6 and 7. When they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. What a turnaround. 
from a night of unproductive fishing, and by the way, that's the best time to fish on the Sea of Galilee, to a morning where a great draught of fish is caught. But now listen to the next part. Begin at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. You get it? Capture, catch. We're not in the business to fish for fish. Doesn't mean you can't fish. That's fine. But we're in the business to fish for men. And the word here, I've been told, means live caught. Some people like live catching fish. They like to see how big they can get one, then turn it back and hope they get it the next time. That's the way they do it. The beauty of our kind of fishing is we get to live catch them and we don't have to turn them loose. They become a part of the body of Christ and we're all united together. No wonder then that the wise man says the wise win souls. But observe further that the wise proclaim God's love. In the book of John chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 We've come to a passage that probably everybody in here could quote better than I can. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. God so loved, the word that he uses there is a form of the word agape or agapao here, I believe. And that word conveys this kind of a thought, that he has an intellectual commitment to the best interests of the object of his love. Too many times I've had uh, people come into my office and say uh, that we're about to get a divorce. Why? And the answer comes back something like this. I don't love her anymore. And my response is to say, you don't have that option. You are commanded to love her. I don't think your problem, though, probably is love. Let me ask you a question, I will say to that man. If, you, if this afternoon, after you two part from my, my office, she sets off one way and you another, and she is in a terrible automobile accident and they rush her to the ER locally and her life is hanging in the balance, Will you leave her there and not go by her side? Oh, no, I'll be there. I'll be there. And then I say to him, it seems to me that your problem is not that you don't love her. It's that right now you don't like her. Because it's a totally different word. It's a totally different idea. God loved us. I would suggest from the reading I've done, he may not have liked us a whole lot. But he loved us. He loved us enough to send his own son, his only one-of-a-kind son, to die in our stead. No wonder the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 6, would write this, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet Peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to God die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that. Were we worthy of what Jesus did on the cross? Were we worthy of the gift that God gave? The obvious answer is no. But having received that tremendous gift, Having received that love in our lives, it seems to me that we are obligated to display that love to the world. To let everybody else know about it. No wonder then that the Apostle Paul, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, upon requesting various prayers of the brethren, says this, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly, to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly 
as I ought to speak. The word boldly there is a word that conveys with all speaking. Don't hold it back. Don't hold any element of it back. Now, all of you have read before what the Apostle Paul said to those same Ephesian elders when he called them from Ephesus to Miletus so he could meet with them one last time face to face. And you remember that he described how that he held back nothing when he preached to them in that time when he lived with them. Brethren, we've got to be the same kind of people. We cannot hold back on displaying the love of Christ. It is what the world desperately needs right now from our brotherhood, from the body of Jesus Christ. In the book of Colossians, we find the Apostle Paul again asking for prayers and talking about prayer. And in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 4, he says, With all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Now, by the way, he goes on to indicate that he wants them to speak, how? With grace seasoned with salt. If you talk about the Ephesian letter, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, he says, speaking the truth in love. Why do I bring that up? Because some people have misunderstood boldness with all speaking as being rudeness. And it's not the same thing. Not by any means. If we want to win the world of Christ, we've got to display the love of God. That's the way that we will display that we are wise. The wise proclaim God's love. But the wise also need to know they can change the world. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, you all know the, the passage. You already are ahead of me there, I am sure. You remember the accusation that they made when they drug Jason and some others out? What was the accusation? Those that have turned the world upside down have come here too. Turn the world upside down. Brethren, we need to quit worrying about who's in office. And we need to start worrying about who's changing the world for Jesus Christ. If we really want to have an impact on this world, turn it upside down, it's time that we preach Christ and Him crucified. That's what Paul did. I give you a challenge. You have to do it some other time. Well, maybe not. Some people, they've already bored with my sermon, so you can do it now. <laughs> Grab you a pen and start at the beginning of the book of Acts and go through, and every time it talks about their preaching, underline what they preached. I'm talking about just a, a quick summary. What did they preach? You know what you're going to find? Over and over and over again, they preached Christ. That's what they preached. Don't worry about whether or not you're green or whatever other color you need to be. It's not important. I'm not saying be disrespectful of, of what you have or what God gave us, what I'm saying is we need to be respectful of the great opportunity He's given us in a sin-sick world. That's what we need to do from the pulpits across our land and really around the world. No wonder Paul then would write to the Philippian Christians in Philippians chapter 2, beginning verse 14, and would say to them, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse world, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Don't you see there he's talking about turning the world upside down? He's talking about making a difference in the world, changing the world. He's talking about a world that is sick, a world that is perverted, a world that is full of wickedness. And what are we going to do about it? We're going to set the example. We're not going to be complainers. Brethren, why is it that so many of us look like we were weaned on a dill pickle? We are children of the king. We need to show it when we go forth into the world. We need to be a display, and as we display that, we need to shine the light. Now, 
significantly. This is not, I am the light. This is, uh, I'm a, a luminary. That is, I reflect the light of, guess who? The Lord, Jesus Christ. I'm like the moon. The moon has no light of its own, but it reflects the light of the sun. And brethren, that's the way we need to be. But we don't need to reflect the light of the S-U-N. We need to reflect the light of the S-O-N. That needs to be our goal in life. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, we find the apostle again writing to those brethren at Colossae. Listen to what he says. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. If someone, and I hope this happens to nobody, seriously, but if some one of you were to have your house catch on fire tonight while somebody else is caring for your children, and some stranger, seeing the fire, rushed and broke through a window and got your children out of the house, what would you think of that person? How would you respond to them? Would, that, would you not, in a sense, love them for the rest of their lives, no matter, no matter what they're about, any, in any other sense? They saved my child. Well, guess what? We've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Don't you think we ought to show the love of Jesus Christ in everything that we do? Shouldn't that be critical to all that we have to say and do? In the book of Colossians, again, chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, Paul went on to say, "...in whom also ye are circumcised." with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith, uh, the faith, excuse me, of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses." How were you made alive? You were dead. You were made alive by circumcision. Do you have to be circumcised to go to heaven? Yes. Not physical circumcision. But you have to be had the sins of the flesh cut off. That's what he said. Where are we going to cut them off? In baptism. That's where God does it. And when they are cut off, then, then we become... No, uh, People who are forgiven. And then thereby our lives are transformed. Our lives are changed. But what about then the lives of those that we teach? Isn't it axiomatic that they too will have their lives changed, transformed? You want to end all the violence in this country? Convert all the violent people. Sounds almost naive, doesn't it? But it'll work. If we'll work it, if we'll do what God wants us to do, the wise, as we've just seen, can change the world. But also, the wise bring joy in heaven. If there's anything that intrigues me, uh, especially about the parables found in Luke 15, it has to be that. Jesus tells a series of three parables. By the way, I believe Neil Lightfoot suggested it might be four. Because usually we talk about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boy. But you know, there's also a lost elder brother. And when Brother Lightfoot wrote about that, he described him as the son who stayed home but left the father. I want to think about that now. Stayed home but left the father. How did he leave him? In his attitude. He's nothing like his father. In his attitude, is he? Just think about it. But the earlier part is what we're focused on right now. First, we have the lost sheep. You remember it. He had 100 sheep, lost one, left the 99, went out and sought, and he found it. And when he found that sheep, you may remember exactly what happened. He came, as he came home, he called his 
friends and his neighbors together, and he said what? Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Now watch verse 7. It's the critical verse in that parable. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Then he tells a second story. It's about a woman with ten coins. She loses one of them. So what does she do? She lights a candle and she begins to sweep the house until she finds it. And when she finds it, what does she do? Well, basically what the same thing the shepherd did. <laughs> she calls her friends and neighbors together and they, they are called to rejoice with her because she's found that peace that was lost. Notice verse 10, because that's the critical passage for what we're looking at tonight. There he says, Likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I can read English. And if I understand the English correctly, we're talking about joy in the presence of the angels of God. I've got one question. Who's in the presence of the angels of God? Sounds to me like God. That's who the angels of God be in the presence of. God rejoices when one lost sinner is found. And we need to remember that. It needs to ring almost in our ears as we go forth with the truth because it brings joy in heaven. It brings joy to the Father. But if any parable demonstrates it more thoroughly, it has to be the next one. It's the parable of that prodigal. You know all about him. You know how that he went to his dad, and I'm going to put this in, in old Gary speak, I guess. It's, uh, you know, I'm not direct quoting here. But basically he says, Dad, you're living too long. I want my inheritance now. And for whatever reason, for the story's sake, Dad gives it to him. And off he goes. And he wastes it, the text tells us. His brother has an extended accusation. I don't know whether he knows that or not. But, uh, but he does waste it, waste every bit of it. And finds himself in a terrible circumstance. You know, he got lots of friends when he got lots of money. He's got no friends when he has no money. And so what does he do? Joins himself to a citizen of the country and he goes out to slop the hogs. And the worst part, he's ready to eat the slop. Right with the hogs. But then he came to himself. By the way, don't you think there's a suggestion here that a person living in sin who won't come out of it is out of their mind they're doing what is against their best interests. That's insanity, to do what's against your best interests. But he comes to himself. What does he do? He decides to go back to the Father. And he's going to go back as a servant. That's his goal. That's his whole ambition. But then we find an interesting part of the text is found beginning in verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was a yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Now stop just a minute. As I envision this, you may totally disagree with me. I see a, a man of some substance who lives in the country. His son has gone off. And in the modern era, I see that, that man going out every day to check the mail, but he's not really checking the mail. Oh, he opens the box and looks in. But what he mostly does is look down the road. What's he looking down the road for? That son. Can he tell his walk from a, a mile away? I think he can. I think he knows it. And so as he sees his son a great way off, then he runs and listen. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. But that's not the whole story, is it? The older brother comes in. He stayed with dad the whole time. Apparently he's been working fields and everything else that you'd expect a son to do. From all we can tell. He comes home and asks the big question. 
What's the party about? <laughs> well, your brother's come home. And we're, your dad's rejoicing. He's killed the fatted calf. Oh, boy. Here we go. It lights him up. I don't really want to focus on the older brother. I want to see the last thing the father says in the parable, verse 32. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. Did the father rejoice when the son came home? There is no denying it. I cannot tell you the number of times when I saw somebody step out into the aisle just a few weeks ago. We had a couple that stepped out, good people, good Christian people, but they had allowed the, the troubles of, uh, of recent times, you know, the virus and their concerns, they allowed that to make them become uh, home worshipers. Well, it's not that they were incapable of getting out we got folks that are shut in that's the only way they're going to be with us is online i get it but these people could have been there they were going to work every day and they were doing other things they just weren't being with us we'd prayed for them the elders had spoken to them in a loving way when they stepped out into the aisle i could not keep singing the invitation song there was joy tears of joy but not just for Gary. If I read this passage right, there was joy in heaven. Our Heavenly Father rejoiced too. The wise bring joy in heaven. The wise also save souls from eternal death. You know, usually when we're talking about winning souls, we're talking about the lost, people who never obeyed the gospel. And that's appropriate because I would assume that the Numbers are far more vast of that group than the one I'm about to talk about. But we do not want to forget our brethren when we talk about winning souls. Because our brethren's souls sometimes need to be won again too. In the book of James chapter 5, you remember beginning of verse 19, James says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth a sinner from the air of his ways shall save a soul from death and cover or hide a multitude of sins. Save a soul from death. That's not the only verse that deals with that kind of an idea. In the book of Galatians chapter 6 beginning at verse 1, the apostle Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in their fault, ye which are spiritual... Restore such a one the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you read that passage closely, of course we're concerned about the brother or sister who is lost, who's overtaken in sin. Of course we're concerned about them. But I want us to look more deeply at the passage and see who cares about it. Ye which are spiritual. Is that you? Is that me? Well, we're going to know. It's not hard to figure out. Do you go and seek to restore them? In spirit of humility? Why? Well, I don't know about you, but here's what I've discovered. Scott Kane's weaknesses are not Gary Hampton's weaknesses. Uh, sorry, Scott. I know Scott well enough to do that. That's all. <laughs> he may fall today because of his weakness. But what happens to me next week because of mine? If I go to him with an arrogant spirit, a holier-than-thou attitude, how do you think he's going to respond to me when I fall? Not very well. And I don't blame him. I don't deserve any better because I didn't give any better. We need to do all we can to save our brethren who have heard from the truth as well. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul's talking about that young man who's having relations with his father's wife. And here's what he says, beginning in verse 4. 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you gather together and my spirit uh, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What's the goal? To go home together. That's the goal. Too many people have looked on discipline as some kind of a vengeful, mean action. It's not. In fact, you want to know what's mean? It's do nothing. That's mean. Know they're on the road to hell and don't try to stop them. That's mean. What's not mean? The wise saves souls from death. That's not mean. But then also, the wise defeat Satan's purpose. Everybody in here can quote 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, probably because we preachers about worn it out. But here it comes. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The devil is at work today in our world. We're at war, brethren. I don't, I don't think we recognize it anymore. Everybody I talk to wants to be totally at peace. No, they want to have it their way. They want to be happy. They want to enjoy, uh, enjoy it. And by the way, really, if you're worshiping God correctly, you will. <laughs> All those things will come. But they don't want to talk about this kind of a thing. They don't want to go there. But the reality is we're at war. Paul uses that imagery more than once in his writings, and you know that. You've studied it. You're aware of it. We need to realize we're at war. I want you, though, to go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 10, because something interesting happened. This is what we call the limited commission. And at the end of the limited commission, Luke, chapter 10, we particularly want to pick up at verse 17 and 18. We find, And the seventy returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I, I've never heard Brother Cates teach on Job, and of course I can now by video, they tell me. Let's see if I can use my computer to get there. But anyway, they, they say I can do that. I don't know what he thought about the opening chapters. But I'm going to tell you what I, the image I see in my mind. I see God in heaven. All the angels are lined up to report. And here comes the devil, and you can almost see him almost busting his buttons. He stands in the line waiting for his opportunity. And putting it in my words, the Lord says to him, basically, where have you been? What you been doing? And he said, I've been going all over the world. And again, in my words, Winning souls to my side. And then God says, watch the smile on Satan's face. I don't know if you see this, but I see it every time I read it. Have you considered my servant Job? And you can almost say, Job. I don't want to talk about Job. You won't let me touch him. You let me touch him. I promise you, he's going to give you up. He's going to curse you. And God says, well, okay. You can touch him. Just don't touch his body. Well, Job tries that. It doesn't work. And so here you come again. As angels lined up, here comes the devil. You can see him again. Busting's, buttons just busting out. He's so excited about what he's been doing. Where have you been? Oh, I've been going around the world finding folks to win to my side. Have you considered my servant Job? Job! <laughs> and here we go, right back down the same road. Only this time he said, skin for skin. If you let me touch him, you let me touch his body, he will curse you. I'm thankful to say that God put a hedge around Job all the time. I don't know if we focus enough on that or not. He didn't let it go beyond what Job was able to handle, as I understand it. And I don't believe he's going to let the devil go beyond what we're able to handle either. There's always a way of escape, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. But you do have to look for it. You've got to be on the lookout for it. 
But it appears to me, from what I understand in Scripture, that the devil is no less active today than he was then. He's no less active in seeking out souls to win to his side than he ever was. He's still at it. And sometimes it appears to me he's been pretty effective. What about you? I think we've got to realize that the wise defeat Satan's purpose. That's what Jesus pictured, isn't it? I saw Satan falling like lightning out of the sky. He's defeated. He's beaten by God's people. How are you going to beat him? I think Paul gives us the answer to that question. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, when he says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You all have read the temptations of Christ. And you know as well as I do that every time that Satan threw something at Jesus, he answered with three words. It is written. If we are going to defeat the devil, brethren, we've got to learn to say, it is written. Look at Paul in the city of Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. What does he do? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of these scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that is this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. What did he use? Word of God. That's what he used, and it worked, by the way. So much so that the devil's folks stirred things up pretty good in that city. Look again. Acts chapter 18. You remember the fellow? His name's Apollos. Apollos knew the truth. The problem was he didn't know the whole truth. The good news is, in his audience, at least once, was, was a good Christian couple, Aquila and Priscilla. They took him aside, and brethren, why the first time we hear somebody say something that is false, why do we attack them in public? Aquila and Priscilla pulled him aside and taught him privately. Now, I'm not saying there doesn't come a time for public, Okay. I've read Romans chapter 16. I'm aware of what it says. But you don't start there. It's more or less an ending place, if you would, and it'll end it. I can almost guarantee you that. When they got through teaching him, and all they really had to teach him was that, that John was saying, look forward to the kingdom, but it's here. The Lord's died. And so he is about, he, he's turned in his teaching, so he teaches the truth that a Savior was born, that he died and he was raised again the third day. By the way, nothing mentioned about him being baptized. Someday I'll talk to you about that. <laughs> I think he was baptized with John's baptism, and probably before Christ died. That's the only thing that makes it logical. Unless Luke just didn't tell us, and that's a possibility. But what does he do when he, after he understands the whole truth? What does he do? Well, he goes into Achaia. And when he gets to Achaia, listen to what it says, Acts 18, into verse 27, on into 28. Who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and publicly, showing by the Scriptures, what? That Jesus was Christ. How are we going to beat the devil? I'll tell you, brethren, we better get back in the Word. That's how we're going to beat the devil. You want to beat him? Learn the truth. Because it's the only thing that will beat him. You're not going to out-logic him if you don't go to the logic of God's Word. You'll never beat him. Can't be done. Never was done, never will be done. We've got to learn the Word. We've got to become a people of the book again. We've got to be folks that when other folks see us, they say, you are one of those folks that attends over there at, at uh, whichever congregation you go to, and all of you guys are Bible bangers. Well, you know, I, that's kind of a, an offhanded nice compliment. <laughs> call, I'm thankful you call me a Bible banger, if you can. There's an old story told. I don't know whether this really happened or not. You know, uh, I just know the story that they went to court one day and the bailiff forgot the Bible years ago. It was in an old southern court. And the bailiff, in embarrassment, when, when the judge said, well, 
you know, call the first witness. The bailiff said, to, Your Honor, I, I, I forgot the Bible. The judge looked out in the audience. He saw Mr. Brown. You and I call him Brother Brown. Remember the Lord's Church. The judge said, See Mr. Brown back there? He's a member of the Church of Christ. Just have, this, have everybody come up and put their hand on his head and swear there. <laughs> it's time we get back there. Because it's the only way we're going to beat the devil. He that wins souls defeats the purpose of Satan. But there's one more thing I think we need to consider. The wise save their own souls. In the book of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning at verse 18, we find, And Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All authority, or all power, hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world, the end of the age. What did Jesus say? Go, later translations have, make disciples. Well, that's, the way you do that is you teach. You don't teach what Gary says or what some of you say. You teach what the Lord says. You're making them a student of Jesus Christ by the teaching that you do. And when you do, ultimately the goal is that they should surrender to the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because that's really what the name of me. It's not a formula for baptism. It's a formula for the authority behind the baptism that we participate in. That's what it is. Is it any surprise then that a fellow by the name of Philip was on that road, that deserted highway, met up with the Ethiopian nobleman, and when he preached unto him, Jesus, what happened? The eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? How did they get there? Because you cannot preach Jesus Christ without preaching baptism. It is impossible to do that. If you're going to call on the name of the Lord, you've got to be baptized. Ananias knew that. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And then look at what Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Later translations don't use the word answer. That's old English. Perfectly good word. But in modern English, watch what, for example, the English standard, the New American standard say, they don't put the word answer, they put the word appeal. In my baptism, I'm appealing to God to save me on the basis of my good works. Is that what he said? I think what he said was, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now anybody in here, a bunch of you have, a bunch of you have had hermeneutics. So you know what I'm about to say. That's a synecdoche. And, I, you know, folks back in Mississippi say, we don't talk that way around here, preacher. <laughs> and I say, well, yeah, yes, you do, <laughs> actually. A synecdoche is either a whole that stands for the part. You say, well, that's nowhere in Scripture. You better read John 3.16 again. That's the whole that stands for the part. Jesus didn't die for the rocks and the trees and the grass. When he died for the world, he died for all of mankind. Okay, that's the synecdoche. That's that side. Look at the other side. The synecdoche is also a part that stands for the whole. Now, here's my simple question. Can you have a resurrection without a death and a burial? I don't know how. So when I am baptized, I'm appealing to God for a clean conscience, not on the basis of my good works, but on the basis of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we need to tell the world that. It's the only way they can be saved, or the only way you and I can be saved, for that matter. Luke chapter 24, Jesus is reported as saying 
some other things in addition to what we've already heard. Here's the way Luke reports it. Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and the repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among every nation beginning at Jerusalem. Isn't that exactly what Peter and the others did on the day of Pentecost? Repentance and remission of sins? How are you going to find remission of sin? Well, surprise, surprise, it's in baptism. <laughs> Isn't that what Peter said, Acts chapter 2, verse 38? He agrees with what we've already studied. He understands that. But now here's where the rubber meets the road for the church. I heard a lesson this morning on the wise and foolish builders. You all know that story. I'm not going to read it to you again. But I want to remind you what's going on there. The wise builder is the one who hears what Jesus says, and he does it. And his house is built on rock. The foolish man is the one that hears what Jesus says and does not do it. And his house is built on sand. It will collapse. If we know that our Lord intends for us to take the gospel to the whole world and we are failing to carry that gospel to the whole world and strive to win souls, brethren, our souls are in eternal jeopardy. Preach the gospel and win souls to save your own soul. Because that's what the text lets us see. He that winneth souls is wise. We've seen that. We've seen it in various ways. Now what are we going to do with it? The bulk of this audience tonight, maybe all of it, members of the Lord's church. I have a simple question. It's not just for you. It's for me as well. The question is, have you talked to all your neighbors about Christ? I was a young preacher, North Little Rock, Arkansas. My first full-time work on my own. Across the street, Caddy Cornered, lived a fine retired man. He, he, he was, had a little farm up somewhere north of where we lived. Ha, I used to be fascinated. I'd go out to work in the yard and He'd see me struggling to do whatever I was trying to do. I'm not talking about push the lawnmower. I know how to do that. <laughs> but he'd see me struggling to do whatever it was that I was trying to do. And all of a sudden, I'd hear a voice, you know, come from a catty corner across the street. Hey, preacher, you know they make a tool for that? <laughs> no, sir, I didn't know they made a tool for that. <laughs> he said, yeah, they do. And the fact is, I've got one. Let me bring it over there and help you figure out how to get this thing done. I loved that man, had a great relationship with him, but did I really? I didn't want to destroy my relationship. I knew what he was religiously, but never sat down and talked to him. Not one time. And then one night, I woke up in my sleep. I looked up at the ceiling. There were red lights flashing on my ceiling. Stood up, I looked out the blinds. In Caddy Corner across the street was a fire truck and an ambulance. Pulled on my jeans and I said, Teresa, I'm going to go see if I can help. And as I went out the front door, the gurney came out with the sheep pulled to the top. I will never get that opportunity back. What about you? It's time we changed. We once were people that knew the value of souls and did everything we could do to win them to Christ. If we're not that today, we need to tell the Lord we've been wrong. And we need to ask for prayer.
But if you're outside of Christ, I don't know what more we could say to you than to say there's only one way. It's call on the name of the Lord and penitent baptism. And by His death, His burial, His resurrection, you can be saved. And I can make you one guarantee. There will be joy in heaven. Why don't you come while we sing?